will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare the committee in recess at any point. The purpose of this hearing is to examine the importance of emerging technologies for border security detection and inspection purposes and explore the coordination of and collaboration of the Department of Homeland Security with private industry. I now recognize myself for an opening statement. Good afternoon and welcome to the Subcommittee on Border Security and Enforcement and the Subcommittee on Oversight Investigations and Accountability to so join hearing on technology's role in enhancing our border security. The crisis at our southern border poses an existential risk to our nation. To combat this threat, emerging border security technologies play a critical role in deterring criminal activity and the mass illegal immigration that we have witnessed under the Biden administration. Illegal immigration has surged to an unprecedented level with approximately 9.7 million illegal aliens crossing our borders since President Biden took office. This is more than double the entire population of my home state of Louisiana. The influx of fentanyl and other deadly drugs is destroying American families and communities. The latest data shows that in the past year, Approximately 13,000 pounds of fentanyl have been seized at the southwest border. Cutting-edge technology is crucial in interdicting these dangerous substances and apprehending drug traffickers. Furthermore, dangerous cartels continually exploit vulnerabilities in our border security. DHS's partnership with the private sector is crucial in leveraging the most advanced technologies available to identify, track, and respond to, to these threats on land, air, and sea. We have a responsibility to our nation to use every tool and technology at our disposal to protect our homeland from these threats. DHS's deployment of emerging, emerging technologies is necessary to combat the illegal movement of aliens, drugs, weapons, and other illicit commodities from crossing the United States border. As transnational criminal organizations and terrorists constantly seek new methods to penetrate the vulnerable border, these innovative technologies are essential in countering the evolving threat, including the use of cartel drones, and coyote smuggling operations. The commercial security industry has always played a vital role in protecting America's homeland. Private sector investments in new technologies have enabled components such as customs and border protections to properly and strategically deploy personnel and technology to maximize the agency's effectiveness and fulfill its mission. I'd like to express my gratitude to our witnesses for appearing before the committee today and to discuss how DHS works with the industry to provide advanced solutions to our law enforcement personnel on the ground, emblematic of the many private partners working with DHS to secure our homeland. Border security technology will never replace frontline agents and officers. However, technology can be a critical tool to aid law enforcement personnel to carry out their mission. The need for advanced technology will continue to grow, as well as a need for personal investment from each one of us as Americans, for us as a committee to support, to prepare the necessary agents on the ground to defend our nation. With that, I yield back the balance of my time. I look forward to hearing from the witnesses, and I recognize the ranking member, my friend, Mr. Correa, to speak on his opening statement. Thank you, my good friend, Chairman Higgins. Um, and thank you, Chairman Bishop, for holding this important hearing, and of course, welcome to our witnesses today. We hope to learn more about what Congress can do to do a better job preparing 
implementing the latest technologies at our borders. Today presents an opportunity to hear about the new technologies that can support Homeland Security. I hope that we in Congress learn the lessons that you all too well know to continue to protect the homeland. I'm pleased to see the Biden administration prioritize integrating advanced technologies like AI or artificial intelligence into Homeland Security initiatives while still ensuring the protection of civil rights and civil liberties. Advanced technologies will help CBP officers and agents work more efficiently and effectively to keep the American people safe. I must say that our nation has always been a nation of international trade and commerce. My home state, California, the San Isidro San Diego border crossing, every day over 70,000 vehicles cross and over 20,000 pedestrians cross that border on a daily basis. Our border customs officers, those folks in the blue uniforms, scanned vehicles using AI-powered machines to detect and interdict drugs and other dangerous substances before they enter our country. These systems not only allow for better, better targeting, but also for quicker inspections. Facilitating the timely flow of trade and travel helps keep the economy strong. Last year nationwide, CBP used over 370 non-intrusive inspection scanners to examine more than 9 million conveyances, resulting in the seizure of more than 127,000 pounds of narcotics and the identification of 125 undeclared passengers. But clearly the challenge, the scale of the challenge is huge and more technology is needed. More scanners means less fentanyl on our streets. More investment in cameras and ground-based sensors means more data that our officers and agents can use to stop human smugglers and human traffickers. But as all of you know, technology isn't enough. In fact, it's the well-trained men and women at our border that are our greatest resource. And technology helps them do a good job but the women, men and, women, men, and, women, men and women at our front lines are very critical. And sadly, our ports of entry today need over 5,000 more CBP officers. 5,000 more CBP officers are needed at our border today to do the job we are asking them to do. Border Patrol is also facing a major shortfall, and even the best technology cannot fill these gaps. And we should also remember that border security does not start or end at our border. Excuse me for a minute. We need the cooperation of our neighbors across the hemisphere to tackle the big problems. We need to be working with Mexico to counter drones and go after smugglers and traffickers. We need to be working with the South American countries to screen passengers coming into the hemisphere at the point of origin. We need to ID potentially dangerous individuals before they even get on a plane to come to this hemisphere. A lot of cooperation is happening, but it's still not enough. Back home in California, we look at the border as an economic driver that adds to our economic growth. California today is the fourth largest economy in the world. Trade and travel across our borders boosts our economic output and brings us closer to our southern neighbors. Today, as members of Congress, we support ways to increase legitimate trade and travel while keeping the American public safe. We often use technology to do this, but sadly, the timely and cost-effective deployment of technologies has been a long-standing challenge for CBP. It is vital that the federal government collaborate with the private sector to develop and adopt cost-effective and innovative technologies sooner rather than later. And to help address this problem, I've worked with Congressman Luttrell to introduce the Emerging Innovative Border Technologies Act. 
And this bill addresses the capability gaps at border security by requiring the Secretary of Homeland Security to submit a plan to Congress to identify, integrate, and deploy innovative technologies like AI, machine learning, and nanotechnology into our border security initiatives. This is just one of many other things Congress can be doing to help our men and women at the border. I look forward to hearing your recommendations today, gentlemen. You are the experts. Let us know what else we can do to make sure that technology comes to the forefront of our battles at the border immediately, not 5, 10, 20 years later. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield. Ranking Member Yields, I now recognize the Chairman of the Subcommittee on Oversight, Investigations, and Accountability, the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Bishop, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon to everyone attending. Thank you to our witnesses for joining us today to share your insights on how the Department of Homeland Security can partner with the private sector for technological solutions to enhance border security. As chairman of the Subcommittee on Oversight, Investigations, and Accountability, I have no doubt of the critical need for DHS to take advantage of technology to increase the operational effect effectiveness of the agents responsible for securing our nation's borders. New technologies act as a force multiplier for CBP agents in the field, and uh, providing them with greater situational awareness and enabling more efficient use of CBP resources. For example, the deployment of the autonomous surveillance towers, unmanned aerial systems, and other surveillance technology along the border facilitates real-time monitoring for potential threats, especially in remote areas that are far more difficult for Border Patrol agents to cover. We know that there have been more than 1.8 million gotaways at the border since January 2021, 194,000 since October 2023, and that's a major national security crisis. Using technology to detect and prevent these threats must be a critical priority. In a 2021 report, however, the DHS Inspector General found that CBP lacks sufficient personnel to fully leverage sur surveillance technology advances. Using artificial intelligence can help alleviate the manpower issue. And uh, uh, enabling surveillance and processing tools to operate with greater autonomy may reserve time for agents to attend to the most significant threats personally. Automating previously labor-intensive tasks also helps free Border Patrol agents to get back in, in the field to safeguard the homeland. Similarly, using uh, the, or the use of non-intrusive screening equipment and facial recognition technology at land ports of entry plays a critical role in protecting the homeland while facilitating lawful trade and travel. A recent Inspector General report also found that because of limitations in camera technology, CBP had only a 76% success rate in capturing images of vehicle passengers at ports of entry and those captured, only 81% were of sufficient quality to conduct adequate screenings. Staying at the cutting edge of technology is vital to national security and defending our border, particularly as cartel tactics and use of technology have become increasingly advanced. In recent years, we've seen cartels routinely deploy sophisticated and widely available drones to conduct counter surveillance on border patrol and to advance their smuggling operations. In February last year, Chief Sector Bo Patrol Agent Chavez testified that the Rio Grande Valley sector had experienced over 10,000 drone incursions in a single year. It is not hard to imagine that cartels have increased the frequency of incursions since then. In transcribed interviews with the committee, multiple sector chiefs affirmed that cartels seek to exploit any perceived vulnerabilities to facilitate human and drug smuggling across the border between ports of entry. CBP's adoption and implementation of advanced CUAS technology is crucial to denying cartels the ability to freely operate drones across the border. The House majority emphasized the importance of border technology when it passed the Border Security Bill, H.R. 2, requiring CBP to present a five-year strategic technology investment plan that lists security technology priorities needed to address risks and capability gaps. 
The bill also requires CBP to provide clear goals and timelines for implementing their technology priorities. HR2 also requires CBP to take steps to streamline the acquisition process and increase partnerships and consultation with the private sector to ensure that CPP, CBP is well informed on technological advances and innovations relevant to the border security mission. The CBP innovation team has legislative authority to fast track technology projects up to $25 million. As CBP considers and pilots new technologies, it is important to define success and identify performance metrics to ensure that money is spent efficiently and effectively. According to the Government Accountability Office, as of July 2022, the CBP Innovation Team invested more than $120 million in 73 cutting-edge technology pilot projects. At the time of the report, however, the team had not clearly derived strategic level goals or quantified performance goals to assess progress. In an environment as fast-paced and crucial to homeland security as a southern border, it is imperative to identify metrics for success in implementing new technologies. It is my hope that our witnesses can help identify these metrics and performance goals so Congress can conduct meaningful oversight over CBP's technology investments. Of course, technology can't replace the need for border patrol agents, a border wall, and the basic will to enforce our immigration laws. It is not a silver bullet to solve the border crisis, but it can help the men and women of Border Patrol to be more effective in carrying out their mission of securing America's borders. Today's hearing is about how DHS can work with the private sector to deliver smarter security and ensure that taxpayer dollars are being used for the greatest effect. I look forward to an informative hearing with our witnesses. And I yield back. Thank you, Chairman Bishop. I now recognize the ranking member the Subcommittee on Oversight, Investigations, and Accountability, the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Ivey, for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Higgins, Chairman Bishop, Ranking Member Correa. Uh, to the witnesses, thank you for appearing today. I look forward to your testimony. Uh, I think my colleagues have raised a lot of the points that I wanted to touch on, uh, but with respect to um, the technology piece for detecting, um, whether it's contraband coming across the border or drones, I think it's critical that we make some immediate and, and, and uh, aggressive steps to try and address that. We've got, uh, when I had a chance to go down to the Rio Grande Valley, uh, about a year ago, I guess, um, we had a chance to see some of the technology that was at work. Um, this picture to my right uh, shows one of the scanners that's used for trucks as they come through. You can see the result on my left side. So it's almost like an X-ray or an MRI machine that, that uh, can detect what's going on inside the truck. Um, and it's uh, been very effective, as I understand it, at uh, identifying contraband and slowing the flow. You can put them down. The challenge at the time was they didn't have enough of them for the ports of entry. I, I know that they've been trying to expand that number over time. One of the things I'd like to hear about today is where we are on that process, um, because they had um, the ability to transmit back to a central location the results from each one of those. Just like if you went to get an x-ray at your radiologist, your radiologist might not be reading it at the place where the x-ray is being done. They might be at a different location. And that allows a more efficient uh, use of the technology and also allows more use of AI because AI does a better job of scanning than the human eye does. Um, so one of the things I'd like to hear about is to what extent we've in integrated the AI into this process and how extensively we're using these because I was told at the time, and again, that was almost a year ago, which is like dog years and, and uh, and tech, that's like 20 years almost, but you know, how far have we come on that front? Because if it's that effective, and I think everybody agrees that we, and, and Border Patrol was certainly in support of it, let's see if we can expand it and do more with it uh, to, in, to uh, intercept more. Because everybody agrees that fentanyl and other contraband coming across the border has been devastating to the country. And if we can have these kinds of solutions, which aren't super expensive, they're not cheap, but they're you know worth the weight of the, worth their weight in gold, I would say, uh, we should be trying to move in that direction quickly. Uh, and as the point was made a few minutes ago, yes, we need Border Patrol agents. I, you know, when we were down there, they said they needed assistance. We've heard at hearings um, 
in some of the reports we've gotten back from Holand that they're 5,000 short on officers and agents. I know we're taking other steps to try and address that. We're working our way through the appropriations process, and there's some hangups there uh, that we need to work through, I think, to make sure that there are no cuts to Homeland. Uh, or, you know, I, I think the White House budget is the way to go. It's a little less than what's been proposed by House Republicans here, but I think we have to find a way to get the money to the front because I think we all agree that um, we might disagree about a lot of things, but I think we all agree that the resources need to go to the border to help address these kinds of issues. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about drones. drones. My uh, colleague, uh, Chairman Bishop, mentioned that already, but that was another one that was brought to our attention when we were down there at the border. The Border Patrol agents were saying that they were outnumbered 17 to 1 on drone usage, and that the drones that the cartels had were more sophisticated than the ones that we'd allocated to them. Now, I'm hoping that that's changed over time, but I'm not sure. And then, of course, the other thing that we need to pay attention to is the rapid uh, transformation of drone technology, in part based on what's going on in Ukraine and in part what's going on in uh, Gaza. When I was in Israel a few weeks ago, uh, we had a chance to tour a company called Raphael that's developing anti-drone technology that uh, is pretty amazing. These are the guys that invented Iron Dome. Uh, the, te the technology they've got for intercepting drones, I believe we are working, we being the United States and the Department of Defense, to uh, get that rolled out quickly. But as you heard a few minutes ago, the cartels are using it for reconnaissance purposes as well as smuggling purposes. And we're not giving our people at the border an equal chance to compete and fight back with that. So to the extent we can do that quickly, I think we should do it. Now, I know there's a couple of bills that are pending in the Congress, in the House here. One of them, uh, I think, had three committees it had to go through. Um, and I know Chairman Bishop referenced uh, HR2 as well. We've got to make sure that, you know, the pieces of those bills that need to get done so we can address the drone issue, that has to happen. I know you guys, that's not your, your bailiwick there. I'm talking to the witnesses, but I'm talking to our House of Representatives too. These are the kinds of things that we need to get done so that we can get the tools to our people who are on the border uh, and arm them in the fight that they're waging right now. I also want to mention quickly um, the uh, DHS's OTA, the Office of uh, Transaction Authority, uh, that does uh, that, that allows the department to bring in uh, cutting edge technology that can be used on these fronts. And I know um, uh, Ranking Member Correa and our colleague, Mr. Luttrell, who's not here, but uh, have legislation to help with this too. We want to make sure we're moving all of this legislation forward as quickly as possible. I know this is a presidential election year. I know uh, all of us were up for re-election or election to something, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, but this is one where I think we have to find common ground and move this legislation, the, le the pieces of legislation, so we can enable our people at the border to defend us and give them the tools that they need to do it uh, effectively. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member Ivey. Other members of the committee are reminded that opening statements may be submitted for the record. I'm pleased to welcome our panel of witnesses, and I'll ask that all witnesses please rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you'll give before the Committee on Homeland Security of the United States of Representatives will be the truth? the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Let the record reflect that the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. Thank you. Please be seated. I'd now like to formally introduce the witnesses. Did it, the Honorable Thaddeus Cleveland, this is one time I get to call you Thaddeus, is a sheriff of Terrell County, Texas. He was appointed in 2022 and was later elected to office before becoming sheriff, Cleveland had a distinguished career in the United States Border Patrol, serving for over 26 years. His last 11 years in Border Patrol was spent as a patrol agent in charge of the Sanderson Border Patrol Station. Sheriff Cleveland served in multiple locations throughout Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas. He also served as an assistant chief 
in Washington, D.C. The gentleman seated to the sheriff's left, Mr. Carl Landrum, is the Vice President of Civilian Programs and Strategy for Didrone, a leader in smart airspace security. Didrone employs sophisticated machine learning video algorithms to detect and pinpoint the position of drones from high resolution video camera feeds and is used to counter malicious drones. Prior to joining Didrone, Mr. Landrum co-founded Landrum Strategies LLC, a business strategy development firm, and served as the chief patrol agent of the Laredo sector of the United States Border Patrol. He was with the Department of Homeland Security for over 27 years in various border security roles. Highly experienced gentleman. To Mr. Landrum's left is Mr. David Berto. The Honorable David Berto is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Professional Services Council. With more than 400 members, PSC is an advocate of and resource for the federal services industry. As CEO, Mr. Berto focuses on legislative and regulatory issues related to government acquisition, budgets, and requirements to improve communications between government and industry. Prior to PSC, Mr. Berto was confirmed in 2014 as the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Logistics and Material Readiness, overseeing $170 billion in Department of Defense logistics funding. I thank the witnesses for being here today. The witnesses' full statements will appear in the record. I now recognize Sheriff Cleveland for five minutes to summarize his opening statement. Chairman Higgins, Chairman Bishop, Ranking Members Ivy and Correa, uh, other distinguished members, thank you for the opportunity to be here today to talk to you about Terrell County, Texas, and our role at the Terrell County Sheriff's Office in border security efforts. Other than my time in the United States Air Force and my time here in Washington, D.C. as a Border Patrol agent assigned to U.S. Border Patrol Headquarters, I have spent a lifetime on the U.S.-Mexico border as both a resident and a Border Patrol agent. As you mentioned, I did spend 26 years in the United States Border Patrol, the last 11 years as the patrol agent in charge of the Sanderson Border Patrol Station, which is my hometown out in Terrell County, Texas, and it's also where I am the sheriff now. I'd still be a Border Patrol agent, but unfortunately, we lost our sheriff to a heart attack, Santiago Gonzalez Jr. I must say his name. He was a very good friend of mine, and he was also a 30-year veteran in the United States Border Patrol. He was our sheriff for a year, and uh, at the age of 55, had a heart attack. It was then at that time I knew it was time for me to take care of my community in a different manner and still be able to support the United States Border Patrol. And I'll be honest with you, I think I can support him more from being the sheriff than I could as a patrol agent in charge. When I talk about Terrell County, it's the 10th largest county in the state of Texas. It's out in the Big Bend region, some of the, the roughest, toughest, most remote border area along the entire 2,000 mile border with Mexico. Terrell County has 54 miles of river with Mexico, and it's a 2,300 square mile county. The U.S. Border Patrol station there has 91 miles of border. That's the third largest amount of border by any station in the United States Border Patrol. With that being said, at the Sheriff's Office, um, fortunately, we now have five of us, to include myself, through Governor Abbott's Operation Lone Star. We've been able to hire two additional deputies for that 2,300 square miles. And then it, the U.S. Border Patrol has about 50 agents. And the reason they don't have a lot of agents is, is we don't have the same amount of activity they do at other places along the border. However, the activity we do have there is, is just important. I'm going to talk about activity. Like the rest of the border, we've seen a significant increase over the last three years, three and a half years. The highest watermark we've had was a 417% increase in illegal alien apprehensions. Again, that's, that's our county alone, 417%. We had 469% increase in gotaways. And again, that's the highest watermark. Each year over the last three and a half years, we've had significantly more apprehensions in our portion of the border. With that being said, historically we'd have one death and we've had 37 deaths over the last three years in our portion of the border. Mr. Landrum and myself, both being Border Patrol agents, we've seen the evolution of 
technology, in, technology deployments in the U.S. Border Patrol. Going back from the historical seismic sensors in the ground that you often had to drive, you know, hours, miles to go and check to verify what actually crossed that piece of, of earth, if you will. Look for sign, look for footprints. Um, we've seen that evolve to Buckeye game camera systems and other camera systems that'll send us real-time images to our, our desktop computers. We've also seen remote video surveillance, what we used to call scope trucks, now remote video surveillance systems, that uh, where it used to be just a blob on the screen. Well, that technology obviously has, has also increased, and, and now we have almost crystal clear pictures that we're able to observe and, and distinguish if it's an animal or if it's a human, and that's also coupled with, with radar. At my station, and, and Chairman Bishop, you menace autonomous surveillance towers, um, I was patrolling in charge and we deployed our first eight towers. Now we have, I believe, 11 in, in Sanderson. And that technology is really, really beneficial because you don't have to have an agent sitting behind a desk monitoring the camera, the, the radar, and the technology does it for the agent until it has an activation and then it, it assists in tracking. But as you all pointed out, with that type of technology, um, unless you have enough Border Patrol agents on the ground to go out and apprehend those that it detects, it's useless. And, and in my environment there in Terrell County, um, we've experienced that quite a bit. We have what is called task saturation, where our technology detects so much that we just don't have the personnel to go out and chase it. And that's where my office comes in as, as far as to, uh, to help support U.S. Border Patrol. Look, in Terrell County, we don't have a crime problem. What we have is, is a border security problem. Back in 2008, I also spent um, six months at the State of Texas Border Security Operations Center that was um, ran by Texas Department of Public Safety. I was Border Patrol's representative there, and that is when they first deployed their um, drawbridge camera systems. They now have over 7,000 cameras along the U.S.-Mexico border, and those provide joint feeds to both the Border Patrol as well as the, uh, the, the uh, Texas Department of Public Safety. I see my time's cutting short here. Um, I just want to mention also that I know we, we talk about multi-layered defense and, and we're often talking about technology in that aspect, but I can tell you what else we need. It's still, regardless if we're at, you know, 8 million illegal aliens crossing or 400,000, it takes partnerships. And, and that's where, again, our, our office comes to play um, along the border, as well as Texas Department of Public Safety, Texas Parks Wildlife Game Wardens, and of course, Texas Military Forces. Last comment I'd just like is to acknowledge the work that U.S. Border Patrol agents do, specifically there in, in my hometown of Sanderson, as well as the Terrell County Sheriff's Office. Um, just a, a tremendous amount of work that's been done. Thank you. Thank you, Sheriff Cleveland. I now recognize Mr. Landrum for five minutes to summarize his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Higgins and Bishop, ranking members Correa and Ivy, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of D-Drone. I hope my testimony will help the subcommittee better understand the rapidly evolving threats in the airspace above our international borders and that sophisticated technological solutions exist to counter these threats and to keep Americans safe. My name is Carl Landrum, Vice President of Civilian Programs and Strategy at D-Drone a U.S.-based global provider of state-of-the-art airspace security solutions with the mission to protect people and property from malicious drones while enabling the good drones to fly. Prior to D-Drone, I served nearly three decades in DHS, starting as a Border Patrol agent in 1996. During my career, I witnessed the use of drones by cartels, transnational criminal organizations, also known as TCOs for drug trafficking, reconnaissance, and surveillance, while noting a lack of technologically based drone detection capabilities within the Border Patrol. Until my retirement in 2023 as a Chief Patrol agent, and including my present work in industry supporting U.S. government customers, I have experienced firsthand the tremendous evolution of drone usage by TCOs to further their illicit and deadly activities. Over the same time, the US government's counter drone technology at the border has struggled to keep pace. To close this capability gap, Congress must ensure that CBP
has sufficient resources to leverage commercially available technologies that can counter TCO drone operations. This investment must be significant and it must happen now as nefarious actors around the world are rapidly advancing their drone operations and exporting capabilities to our borders. In the early days of the Ukraine conflict, D-Drone's counter uncrewed aerial system, also known as CUAS, de was deployed a crucial role in detecting drone activities. However, as the conflict progressed, the techniques, tactics, and procedures, or TTPs, used by both Russia and Ukraine have evolved at the speed of war. Rendering traditional radio frequency or RF detection methods, such as decoding, ineffective. Russia's ability to manipulate and conceal the RF signatures from its drones through technologies like spoofing, cloning, and even autonomous flight has made the sole reliance on decoding unreliable. Rooted in a long-standing tie between Russia and certain countries in South America, we have begun to see some of these TTPs arriving in the Western Hemisphere and making their way to our own borders. Cartels in Mexico have billions of dollars to invest heavily in sophisticated drone tactics learned from conflicts abroad. These tactics include drone-mounted improvised explosive devices and DMIEDs are already being used on the Mexican side of the border today. This past January, D-Drone entered into a contract with CBP at no cost to the government to perform a long-term demonstration of CUAS capabilities along a five-mile stretch of the U.S. border in Laredo, Texas. To date, D-Drone has invested over $3.3 million to establish a multi-layer CUAS detect, track, and identify DTI capabilities, including radio frequency, radar, and camera sensors, as well as software powered by AI, including machine learning and computer vision. The Laredo demo can detect nearly 600 different drone models, including both hacked and homemade drones. In the first 80 days of the Laredo demo, we identified approximately 2,400 flights in the airspace. DJI drones detections represented 71% of those alerts. Additionally, 16 other drone manufacturers were detected in the airspace. This multi-layer solution of RF plus radar plus camera combined with AI-driven sensor fusion has provided CBP complete air domain awareness along these five miles of border. Without D-Drone's larger investment, 29% of drone flights in this airspace would have gone undetected. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to answering your qu any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Landrum. I now recognize Mr. Bertal for five minutes to summarize his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, Chairman Higgins, Chairman Bishop, Ranking Member Correa, and Ranking Member Ivey, and the rest of the members of the committee, it's a great privilege for me to be here today. Uh, I represent the Professional Services Council, as you noted in your opening statement, uh, Chairman Higgins, that's over 400 member companies. Uh, it's large, medium, small companies, and we cover only federal government contracting. That's our focus, is, is how does the federal government get more out of the private sector? Uh, and that, to do that, I want to emphasize the partnership. I'd like to deviate a little bit from my statement and respond to some of the comments that each of you raised in your opening remarks and talk about how we come into play there. And Chairman Higgins, you raised it, the real issue right at the beginning, right? The threat is evolving faster than our ability to acquire and use the technology. It's not that technology isn't developing fast enough. It's that the government processes to put the requirements in place, this is what we need to get the funds in place, get Congress to authorize and appropriate those funds, and then actually issue the contracts and administer those contracts. That's a long period of time. So you, you put your finger on it right there. We gotta move faster because the threat's evolving faster to take use of that technology. And, and 
uh, Mr. Correa commented about, you know, tech's not enough. You got to have the people. And, and I think that when we look at it, if I believe, Mr. Ivy, you mentioned AI as a, as a supplement to that. It's not to replace people. It's to actually use the time that people have to be more effective. And that's one of the real challenges we have because we can overwhelm ourselves uh, in that regard. Mr. Bishop, you focused on what really matters a lot to me, which is streamlining the acquisition process so you can actually get to results faster, right? And to increase that partnership. And we've got a number of recommendations that we come into play there. So let me, let me just say from PSCs, our three main goals, and they're not just goals for technology at the border, they're goals for the whole federal government. Our goal is to help make the government a smarter customer. By that we mean better able to know what they can get, what's out there, you know, they come looking to you, if, I mean, the, the first thing that the government will say is, well, I don't have a requirement for that. That's because they didn't know you could do it. So make them a better, a smarter customer. Make them a better buyer, better able to go get it faster. But more importantly, streamline the process so you can get technology at the pace it's developing. And then finally, all of you mentioned the connection to the workforce. If you don't have the people, it doesn't matter what the technology is going to do. So we have four suggestions that we make for this Congress and, and for DHS to do that, and I'll be glad to go into those in more detail uh, in, my, in, my, uh, in the questions here. One is that we believe DHS should focus its contract requirements more on results and outcomes. What do I want to get done with this contract rather than just on inputs? I'm going to buy so much time, so many labor hours, so many labor categories, et cetera. Number two is Congress can support long-term commitments better by passing appropriations on time. When you don't get your appropriations until March 23rd, and then it takes OMB a month to apportion it down to headquarters, and it takes headquarters another month to apportion it down to CEBP, you got three months left in the fiscal year to spend the money. Right? We, you can get the technology faster. DHS can deliver the results faster if we appropriate the funds on time. The third is that contracts take too long. And we think Congress can help DHS speed up the time it takes to award contracts. I'll be glad to elaborate on that a little more during the questions. And then finally, uh, in, in the end, you know, innovation and technology doesn't do any good if people can't use it. Right? And so you need to train, you need to take into account how people are going to use it as part of that process. You know, innovation that we don't use is not a solution. It's just an additional problem to come into play. So we think a lot more emphasis needs to be done on training for use and a focus on use when we acquire that technology. With that, uh, uh, gentlemen, I'll uh, close my remarks and, and tell you I'm grateful for your time and consideration on these matters, and, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Bertal. Members will be recognized by order of seniority for five minutes of questioning. An additional round of questioning may be called after all members have been recognized. I now recognize myself for five minutes of questioning. Um, Mr. Landrum, would, would you clarify for the committee and for the Americans that are watching regarding drone technology. In my limited time, it's just what I'm going to focus my questions on for you gentlemen. Regarding drone tech and anti-drone tech, will you explain the difference between defensive and offensive capabilities for anti-drone technology for America? Yes, sir. When it comes to, to CUAS capabilities, which is what you're referring to, there are two big portions of that. One of them is the ability to detect, track, and identify a drone that is flying in an airspace that is being covered by that particular technology. This is what I'm referring to is not to interrupt, but that's what we would call defensive drone technology. Would you explain offensive drone technology? Yes, sir. That side of it is, called, is referred to as mitigation. And mitigation can take forms of radio frequency, so via jamming, radio frequency jamming. It also could be kinetic, and just depends on the situation. Inside the United States, kinetic is not used. So for radio frequency interruption for a drone that's been observed by a law enforcement professional on the front line as, as um, a suspicious drone, a criminal drone. The, the defensive technology of our anti-drone capabilities is that we can track those drones and we can show the history of that flight, we can identify that drone, but the, but the full capability of anti-drone technology, I bring this up for my colleagues across the aisle primarily, 
because what the, the administration has been telling us, what the, what the Secretary of Homeland Security has been telling us, that we're using that anti-drone technology, but he's only telling you the half-truth. He's using the defensive capabilities of our anti-drone technologies, not the offensive capabilities or the mitigation capabilities. So when you, when you talk about radio frequency interruption, you talk about landing that drone, correct? What we were talking about with jamming, with radio frequency jamming, which can be band jamming, spectrum jamming, in some, in some cases, or, or some technologies. What happens to that drone? If what, what you're doing is you're breaking the connection between that drone and its pilot. Right, so what happens to the drone itself? The drone generally, in every situation, is, is different. Every single environment is different, and, and what's available mechanically is different. But generally what happens is one of three choices. Either one, that drone will be disrupted, it won't know what it's doing, so it'll return to its home location automatically. Two, it could just come straight down to the ground. Or three, if the right circumstances existed, you could actually take control you of that drone. You take control of it. So it in the it. interest of, of time, I'm trying to get to here, the offensive capability of our existing anti-drone technology allows us to disconnect a criminal drone from its operator and take control of it either because we, we land it or we actually seize control of it. Is this a technology that we currently have? We do have very limited amounts of that technology. Okay, okay Sheriff, long ago, when, when I was a young police officer, 20 years ago, I think it was 2005, um, one of the more interesting things that happened that week, we had a, 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 a armed robbery, high-speed chase. You know, I happened to be involved or able to, to, to force the, uh, the suspect's vehicle to crash. In the process, crashed my own car, but made the arrest. When the, when the supervisor showed up pretty quickly, my crash patrol car and that crash suspect car was not treated at, with a, a typical Louisiana Uniform Motor Vehicle crash report. That it was treated as a criminal, uh, as a as a part of a law enforcement action in that response to criminal activity. So the crash itself was documented in our in our investigative report, not in a typical uniform motor vehicle crash report because it was a law enforcement action. On our border, when law enforcement uses the offensive capabilities of our existing technology to bring down a drone, this administration wants to treat that, that law enforcement action as a crash to be investigated by FAA. So this is something we have follow-up questions we're going to deliver and write into you, gentlemen. But it, it's an area where I believe that this, that this committee can come together and address the, the common sense difference between a law enforcement action where a drone is taken down using existing technologies that we have versus an aircraft crash that requires investigation by FAA. My time has expired, but my interest in this topic is not. I yield to the ranking member. Thank you, uh, and Mr. Chairman, I, I concur with you on this being an issue for both of us to work on both sides of the aisle. <clears throat> I want to also add to that another wrinkle in our FAA law, which is if our locals want to take down drones or do anything with drones, right now they are prohibited from touching drones. Only a federal authority can actually do anything of a sort to a drone. So that means my folks back home monitoring Disneyland or an Anaheim Angels game, it's the local authorities, they have no power over bringing down a drone. So there's a lot of issues in existing law that we have to address more in lines, really, of how do we coordinate federal, state, and local agencies against this, you know, this danger, so to speak. Uh, if I may, gentlemen, thank you for your, your comments. Uh, Mr. Lander, I'm going to start with you. Uh, yesterday we spoke and you said, 
you started seeing drones at the border as early as 2014? No, it was late 2015, 2016, 2017 is where we really started seeing this activity at the border. And have we reacted? Do you believe the Homeland Security reacted appropriately to these threats at that time? Sure, I, I think the, the reaction has was, was slower than I would have wanted it to be as a Border Patrol agent on the border at the time. But there has been a reaction, and yes, some, some equipment and some assistance has arrived to help the agents. And, and you know, not only is the, the number of drones coming across the border increased, but you said something right now that caught my interest. You said cartels in Mexico have billions. We know they are. They have the best consumer market in the world, American drug consumers. They've got a lot of money. Uh, but you said cartels in Mexico have billions to, and they're using explosive devices on whom? There, there, there are multiple open source media reports and easy Google search can, can deliver dozens upon dozens of these throughout the entire country of Mexico. Where, where drones with explosives are being utilized down there. In addition to the- Utilized against who? Authorities or each other or all the above? Um, I, think, I think it's really all the above. Um, definitely utilized between rival cartel positions and government of Mexico positions, but also as recently as just last Friday in my, in my longer opening statement, just last Friday, you know, a cartel attacked some local community members um, in, in, a, in a drone attack that went on for a couple of hours. So these are very dangerous offensive capabilities that are now being introduced to drones. The, these are dangerous offensive used. capabilities that are being utilized by the cartels and they are getting... And as I watch what's going on on a daily basis, the Ukraine war, uh, this technology is evolving on a real-time basis every day. Somebody's coming up with a better way to hit the other side, so to speak. And I guess, uh, Mr. Berto, you, you gave us three ways that we could speed up the delivery of these technologies to our front line, so to speak. I'm just concerned, given what I know of a bureaucracy, both state and federal, that we're gonna have to need we're gonna need a new way to, to deal with this because if drones are evolving on a daily basis, uh, this threat to our country is, is multiplying as we speak. Yes, sir, and, and I think this, with the speed and the scale of that multiplication will continue to increase over time. But I also think that American ingenuity can respond to that with the technical capabilities and the data integration necessary. To if the bureaucracy moves out of the way. Uh, the bureaucracy has demonstrated a number of times when it can do that. Uh, one of you mentioned the other transactions authority that's available, for example, to, uh, to D Department of Homeland Security to do that. I would recommend this committee take a look at it, and I'd be glad to amplify this for the record um, at, at some of the expansions of that agreement authority that the Defense Department has been given to move from prototypes into actual production products that you can deliver. And recently, last year in the, in the National Defense Authorization Act, uh, the Air Force got authority to use operations money, that is O&M in DOD terms, to incorporate new technology into existing systems, which would speed up the process a whole lot because there's a lot of platforms out there that are obsolete, but you can bring new technology in as, as part of that. And then the last piece of it is actually using the data. You mentioned non-invasive technology. I actually had a contract at Otay Mesa 26 years ago to look at sampling non-invasive technology for cars coming across the border, right? What happened is we quickly overwhelmed the computer's ability to actually use the data and analyze the data. We could collect data faster than we could analyze it. Today, with artificial intelligence, the reverse is true. We're actually running out of data. We need more collection of data to be able to analyze it quickly and get it to the agents. All of those are things that would speed up the process even with the bureaucracy where it is. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, I yield. The gentleman yields, recognize the, the chairman of the Oversight Subcommittee for Homeland Security, Mr. Bishop, for his question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Landrum, I guess first you, uh, I, I was taken by what the chairman uh, was discussing about um, 
uh, defensive and offensive capabilities and specifically offensive. One, first time I ever heard, and I think the number then used was like 3,500 flights, and I've heard about this 10,000 flights in a sector, and your testimony suggested detecting, and I don't know what period it was, but 2,400 flights in a five-mile area. I think I heard. Is that what I heard? It's in a five-mile area over an 80-day period of time. So, that's, so that starts to sound like even the numbers that I've heard before are small compared to what actually is happening. Happening. Am I getting the right message there? Yeah, yes, sir, you are. So just a massive number of, and is this cross-border cross activity or just drones in the area? That number is all drone activity within 400 meters of either side of the border. Okay, but a lot of it's cross-border, I said? Um, there is cross-border, and, and that particular number over that same 80-day 80, 80 period of time is approximately 146 incursions in okay. that five-mile area. Okay, so um, to distinguish the two issues then for me in terms of what I ought to be concerned about as a member of Congress, certainly I'm, I was stunned to hear the number of cross-border flights that are allowed, you know, that are, that are happening over the American border uh, as something I just would have assumed that whenever a, a drone's crossing the border and it's unauthorized, somebody would take action and stop that. There, but, there, is, there is no legal way to uh, fly a drone over the border. It, that does not exist. So any drone that crosses the border in either direction has committed a violation. And yet, it sounded to me that, I mean, it's not like you use, uh, the uh, DHS uses offensive action against every uh, unlawful crossing drone, right? Um, that, that's correct, Congressman. They... Why don't they? I remember in an earlier hearing, I said, well, why aren't they shot down? <laughs> Ms. Titus uh, ridiculed me for that by saying that would mean they'd be shooting uh, drones down at Las Vegas National Airport. And I said, well, I didn't have that in mind, but out over the wilderness border area, if, some, if a drone's crossing, I, I, again, I'm not an expert, but why, why wouldn't there be offensive action taken against every such drone? I, 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 and, and again, I retired a year and a half ago, but I believe this statement is still true to this day. What DHS and specifically CBP with that particular border mission, what they need is they need greater resources from this body, from Congress. Okay. They need those resources pushed to the border to be able to invest into these commercial technologies. All right, and now, so Mr. Berto, I'm gonna go to you then, because you asked, you uh, uh, teased this issue about contracts take too long. Uh, a lot of what we're hearing and a lot of what we hear out of Ukraine, one thing that I, and, and even missiles and so forth, or drones fired against Israel or, or launched against Israel, obviously, where we respond with, you know, missiles off of fired off of ships and so forth, and it, and their drone costs a hundred bucks, and the missile costs ten million to shoot it down. That that seems like an asymmetry that we can't tolerate forever. Comment as you will, and we'll save some time for the share if you will, uh, on the, the what you say about contracts take too long, and are we facing a problem of asymmetry that we've got to figure out some other ingenuity to, to solve? First of all, Mr. Bishop, on the asymmetry, we're definitely facing that problem. I mean, obviously, you can't spend a $10 million missile to sink a $100,000 target because you're going to run out of money before they run out of targets, right? Even in um, Washington. And, 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 but I think technology is on our side there, our ability to actually find ways to do that. And Ukraine has been an enormous test bed here. But I also want to go back to the speed things up. So in my time in the Pentagon, at the height of, of the campaign against ISIS in Afghanistan, um, we had something called the Joint Rapid Acquisition process, right, where, where an urgent need could be sped up through the process with some funding that was available to both demonstrate what you could do and do it quickly. So the government can move fast, not for everything, not for all the time. So would shortly, suggest, would that be the model you would look to if you were It certainly would be a model that I would use as part of that, and I'd be happy to expand on that for the record as well. Sheriff Cleveland, in the short, about a minute I've got left, I want to ask you, you mentioned the word saturation at some point, saying that you essentially you're able to use these equipment, these types of equipment spot all you need, but it doesn't really make a difference in the mission, maybe, because you're taxed completely. Speak to that, if you will, and whatever else that occurs to you about what, based on what you've heard from the other witnesses. Yes, sir. So as I mentioned, the Sanderson Border Patrol Station there in Terrell County has 91 miles of border they're responsible for. They're responsible for all 54 miles of Terrell County and then the southeastern portion of Brewster County. So when you have 50 agents, approximately 50 agents, patrolling 91 miles of border, and you factor in days off, annual leave, sick leave, you're actually you know left with about three or four agents on duty at a given shift. Um, and then... They're responsible for all of that border and responding to all those sensor activations, whether they're ATS towers or AST towers, um, Buckeye game cameras, um, and then, of course, the remote video surveillance systems. Yeah. 
if get people, and by the way, if you're, if you're able to acquire uh, targets and go apprehend people, then they get processed and released into the country. That's another issue. How you like? The gentleman yields. I now recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee on oversight, the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Ivey, for his questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Landrum, let me pick up where Chairman Bishop left off with respect to responding to these drone incursions. And I suppose they don't actually necessarily need to cross the border just for reconnaissance. They could be on the other side of the border and still, you know, depending on whatever camera capability they have, get whatever information they need without crossing the line. But let me ask you this, what kind of countermeasures, I, I think that's what Chairman Bishop was getting at, do we have the capability to actually respond? If, if my math was like, it's, I guess around 30 incursions a day, something like that with drones that you all were detecting with the, what you had uh, put up, do we have the ability to respond to those in some way or, you know, take them down or, you know, I don't know if it has to be an intercept uh, actually, but um, you mentioned the decoding piece, which I, I don't, I, apparently they've got the ability to prevent that, but what capabilities do we have to defend ourselves against those kinds of incursions? Congressman, I, I, I don't know the current numbers today, but I can tell you that when I retired from Laredo sector as the chief patrol agent there at that time, I can tell you that at that time we had two devices that we could utilize to cover 177 miles. Each device covers about one kilometer in each direction. So you can extrapolate the math from that. It's, it's very difficult to get in the path and to actually mitigate something when you have so few resources to be able to do it. All of that being said, I do think it is super important for this body to understand that getting a complete picture of domain awareness down at the border, so utilizing track, detect, and identify to see every drone at the border, that part is extremely challenging. And without additional technology to the border, in addition, you know, in addition to the RF that's available today, but going to complete RF to detect all drones and radar to detect drones that are not emitting a radio frequency signal and camera to be able to slew to cue that camera to provide that information to the end user, all of that is necessary. Let, let me follow up on that. So if I'm hearing you right, the, you have a single device, this is a year and a half ago, that would cover a kilometer each way, I think you're saying. Um, how much would one of those devices cost? But what's it called? What kind of, what's that device called? Um, they're just generally referred to as mitigation devices. It, de it depends company by company. And they're also drones? No, they are not drones. Okay, they, what are they? They're, they are, are radio frequency jamming capabilities. And they're, they have to be devices that, that are, go up into the air to, to do that? And, and their range is about one kilometer, 1 1.2. How much does each one of those cost? Um, rough order of magnitude, you can get them, you could get them from our company um, as cheap as $50,000 um, for some mobile devices and then for some other devices that are available, they could range anywhere from $250,000 up to $800,000 per device. Let me ask you what's being done, I see I'm running out of time, but what's being done in Israel uh, and Ukraine with respect to intercepting um, drones? It's, it's still the, the, the same technologies of radio frequency jamming. And in some of those cases, um, they actually utilize, uh, miti when it comes to mitigation, they'll use what's called kinetic mitigation, which could be something as simple as shooting an AK-47 at the, at the drone that they visually see with their eye. All right. And uh, last, well, geez, I run out of time. But I wanted to uh, actually follow up with... Mr. Berto, about the procurement process, because I've, I've heard variations of this with respect to other types of technology um, and how to accelerate it. Because, especially in the, in the instance where you have long-term contracts that are, say, three years or five years or something along those lines, and while that contract is running, someone develops a new technology that could actually perform that function better, um, but they've run into trouble convincing 
could be the Department of Defense, I don't mean to pick on them, but whatever the government agency is, to terminate the contract or do something in, in order to integrate the new technology and use that. Uh, is, has that been your experience and are there ways to try and address that so we can integrate the new technology that's, that's available? And then a variation of that, way back in the day on the software piece when we were, the government was having trouble with that, they went with off the shelf, I think it was GAO or something that did it. Is there a variation of that where, you know, we got commercially available, in this instance, drones. I guess this is a list of commercial companies that are making drones. I'm not sure, but is there a variation of that where we could just, the government becomes, instead of a procurement through the, the RFP process, which takes forever, as you pointed out, we just do more of an off-the-shelf uh, off approach to purchasing these uh, drones or countermeasures. First of all, um Ranking Member Ivey, it, it is a very common problem that a contract in a realm of technology development can become obsolete pretty quickly. And, uh, and it, it, that's not the fault of anybody, but it, it is a natural result of you tend to buy under contract that which you bought before. The starting point of any renewal contract is basically the old contract that you had in place. So it takes a lot of effort for the government to do kind of the market research to say, what can we do beyond that? There's three things you can do to, to help fix that. Number one is better market research, and we've urged the government to do that market research not only before the solicitation, before the request goes out for bids, but as they're evaluating the bids. So, you know, a year after you've developed the solicitation, you're evaluating these bids. Take a look at what the market can do now, not what it could do two years ago when you did your market research. So that's the first thing. The second thing is actually, as I mentioned earlier, focus on the outcomes and the results you want. If you write that into your contract, it's a lot easier to modify the contract to get what you need as technology evolves rather than have to scrap it and start all over again. And give me third. And the third thing is you need the support of the leadership of the agency to be able to do that. When I mentioned the Joint Rapid Acquisition Council in DOD, it had the strong support of the Secretary of Defense. It had all the people in the room who could waive whatever regulations they needed to waive so you could get that. You can't do that for everything, but you can do it for the most important things. Well, let me thank the Chair for his indulgence in allowing me to run over. And I, I would ask, as you've offered, uh, for you to provide additional writ written information about how we can go about integrating that approach. And thank you. We'll be happy to do that, sir. Thank you. Gentleman yields. I, I knew not to interrupt Mr. Bertog. He's married to a Louisiana woman. And I don't want to get fussed at. The chair recognizes our colleague, my friend, Ms. Green, the gentlelady, for her five minutes of question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for being here today. Fentanyl is the number one killer of Americans between the ages of 18 to 45. It kills approximately 300 Americans every single day. Fentanyl doesn't discriminate based on whether we're Republicans or Democrats, our race, our gender, no identity. Fentanyl doesn't care. It kills people. Um, since Joe Biden has taken office, we've seen a record amounts of fentanyl pour into our communities from the southern border. According to Georgia Nar Narcotics Association, approximately seven out of 10 pills on the streets are laced with fentanyl coming across the southern border. In counties throughout my district, in Georgia's 14th district, uh, from ever since 2020, fentanyl-involved deaths have increased over 350%. It's highly prevalent. Since Joe Biden took office, approximately 62,000 pounds of fentanyl have been seized at the border, yet federal officials estimate that they are only able to seize 5 to 10% of all fentanyl smuggled across the southern border. I'd like to ask each of you um, about this because this, this is Americans being murdered right here at home. And, um, and we're talking about technology and our government is spending a lot of money on technology. But where do you believe our border security technology systems are failing? so much so that we can only seize five to 10% of fentanyl smuggled across the southern border. I'll start with you, Sheriff. Howdy, ma'am. So uh, I can speak to Terrell County. We haven't had a marijuana seizure in about five years. And the reason we haven't had a marijuana seizure or any other narcotic seizure, and I was the patrol agent in charge at my station for the last 11 years before taking over as Sheriff, is because we used to have airplanes that would fly 
to the border. They would land short of the border and they'd have radar fades where they'd fall off radar. Um, AMOC, the Air Marine Operations Center out in Riverside, California would provide us those GPS coordinates of those radar fades and we would communicate my station with the government of Mexico in Ciudad Acuna and they would send out um, the Mexican military to either destroy clandestine airstrips or seize that marijuana. Mm -hmm. So in my county, we have not had any of the fentanyl seizures, but I will tell you that I've spoke at many fentanyl events and I'm actually flying back into DC Friday to speak at the Lost Voices of Fentanyl here on the monument, or I'm sorry, on the mall at the monument. Um, you're right, fentanyl is killing um, hundreds of thousands of Americans and China is able to do it without firing a single bullet. Mm -hmm. um, when we, we look at the left, the left's gonna tell us it's coming between the or at the ports. The right's going to tell us that it's coming in between the ports of entry. But the honest thing is, is that we still have a porous border and it's able to come through. Thank you, Sheriff. Mr. Landrum. I, I would echo everything that uh, that Sheriff Cleveland said there. I mean, all, all of that is true. In my personal experience, um, in the state of Arizona, I have overseen men and women border patrol agents there that have seized hundreds of pounds of fentanyl. So I have seen it firsthand in my experience there. In my experience in Texas, I have not seen it in, in my experience in Texas. Mm -hmm. So I can't make the same claim that I can when I worked in Arizona. Mm -hmm. All of that being said, I completely agree that this is being done, these precursors that are being sent are being done with full intent from China to actually do that. And it is negatively impacting our country to the tune of 100,000 deaths a year, you know, plus, or, plus or minus in there, and that is huge numbers. Um, you can definitely relate it to an act of war. Mm, thank you. Mr. Bertow, did I say that right? Thank you. Uh, so I, I go back a ways in the government, and back 35 years ago, I actually was the oversight for the DOD role in the counter-drug mission. Mm -hmm. Nobody heard of fentanyl at that point, right? but the problems are remarkably similar. And there were three things. Number one is we had trouble detecting. Right? We couldn't tell what was coming in it. Number two is as soon as we closed off one point of egress, they'd find another one. We closed off the southern border, they'd come off the California coast. We closed off the California coast, they come in through Vancouver. I suspect that's still at work today, although I'm not, I'm not up on the day-to-day -day piece. Number three is the, the consumption at the other end, right? Because a big problem with the war on drugs is as, as Mr. Correa mentioned, is we're the market. Right? Now, unfortunately, in those days, we had a conscious market that knew what they were buying. Now we have people who have no idea what they're doing. So I think there, is, there are a couple of technical solutions to this. They're probably pretty expensive. I don't, I'm not a technology person, right? But I, I, I can try to translate that. I think it comes into the fact that how do we include, increase our ability to detect, right? Whether it's 10% that we're catching or 20%, we'll never be 100%, but we ought to increase this. The fourth piece, and I think this is the first time it's been mentioned up here, is the role of China in all of this. Right? And I don't think we could ignore the fact that the drone technology is coming out of China, the, um, the drug technology is coming from China. So somewhere you have to get back and interdict at the source as well as at the receiving end. I think none of those are easy. They're hard to do. They're technically hard to do. I would certainly want to focus uh, the efforts of this committee on getting the technology to be able to increase our ability to, to detect because you can't intercept unless you can detect. Thank you. I agree with you. We also have to hold the Mexican cartels accountable because they're the ones smuggling it in the country. So, but I, I definitely agree. Um, I'm out of time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentlelady yields. The gentleman from Mississippi, Mr. Ezell, is recognized. For thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you, all our witnesses, for being here today. Uh, you can pick almost any spot on the map in the United States and find an example of a border crisis. Every state is now a border state. As a former sheriff, I know this disaster does not just affect a single community. The physical and emotional toll on our men and women of law enforcement responding to this disaster is also another. Uh, cause that can be placed directly on this administration. We must be d doing more to support our first responders. I'm completely supportive of trying to identify easier, better, and safer tools for our law enforcement officers, including their ability to share information. This is why with my colleague, Mr. Ivey, and I introduced H.R. 8654, the Streamlining Law Enforcement Information Sharing Act. Congress should be finding ways to improve the effectiveness and efficiency of federal 
programs intended to help law enforcement collect relevant information from federal agencies, state and local governments. Today's discussion focuses on a new technology that can also improve officers' ability to protect our American citizens. But I wanna make sure we do so in a way that does not compromise private citizens' data or information. Uh, Sheriff Cleveland, thank you so much for your service and thank you for being here today. Uh, uh, can you talk a little bit about how advancing technologies and information sharing platforms enhance your ability to coordinate across agencies and jurisdictions? Well, again, having been a Border Patrol agent in, in my home county, um, you know, we're pretty well integrated in information sharing there, and, and it's nothing that I've done. It, it's something that the state of Texas, U.S. Border Patrol, mm -hmm. and, and at our county levels along the border, and I'd probably say that all along the U.S.-Mexico border, just because of the border security issue going back decades. Mm -hmm. um, we're pretty well integrated in that manner. Um, but I would like to mention something I, I didn't mention in my opening remarks is networking, something that we've done um, different in our portion uh, of Texas, and it, and it goes on down the border, is using the, the same um, apps to, to communicate. Um, we may have a vehicle that comes in my county, and uh, we may see it for a while, suspect it uh, of being there for, for you know reasons to smuggle, and then we'll get on our chat group and send it on down the line. Mm -hmm. And we've had many, many cases of successful interdictions of illegal alien smuggling loads, six, seven counties down the road, 300 miles down the road, right close to San Antonio. Mm -hmm. So uh, I do uh, agree with what right. you said, but I, but I do believe we're pretty well integrated along the border at the federal, state, and local level. Very good. Uh, we know that AI, drone systems, and similar tools are helpful aids to our law enforcement, but ultimately a successful operation still comes down to a well-funded, trained, and a highly supported in our personnel. Uh, do you agree the human aspect is still clear the most effective factor to achieve your department's mission as technology advances? Most certainly. Um, and as I mentioned earlier as well, you know, you can have so much technology that right. takes so much, and if you don't have the manpower to go out and actually put the handcuffs on the, the bad guy, mm -hmm. then it's gonna be useless. Very good. I know you are an end user of the border technology in your experience. What types of performance metrics are important for us to consider? Well, at the local level, um, mine is my community. You know, am I able to respond to all the incidents that, that go on? And as I mentioned earlier, we don't have a, a crime problem, we have a border security problem. And I actually have a guest with me here, Mr. Ratley. He's a retired Air Force Colonel. He's a landowner down in my county and he spends part of his time up here in Washington, D.C. where he has his home. And uh, a few months back, his property was actually broken into. Um, fortunately, he had a uh, camera system and, and he was up here in Washington when it happened, and the, uh, um, he witnessed it happening. He, he called me immediately. Uh, the hardest thing I can, can tell a landowner or a citizen in my county, and I've had to do it as both the patrol agent charge at the Border Patrol Station and the sheriff, is I don't have anybody to send right now. And that was my response to him at that moment. Oh, my goodness. However, he, was, he called the neighboring Border Patrol Station and Comstock Station, and they actually had somebody in the area who was able to respond right away, they were able to catch the subject in his house, and, uh, and then we were able to take custody of that individual to, to prosecute him. Um, but there's many examples of, of similar incidences. So, you know, again, keeping my community safe is, is gonna be my metric in, in how we assist the United States Border Patrol. You know, that's, that's uh, you know, my focus as a former law enforcement officer like yourself is manpower, uh, taking care of the troops, getting them what they need so they can operate and do their job. So. Uh, I'm out of time. Thank you all for being here today. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The Sheriff yields. The gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Strong, is recognized for five minutes for question. Thank you, Chairman Higgins, Ranking Member Correa. Thank each of you for being here today. Um, I don't have to tell you how important cutting-edge technology is for our law enforcement, particularly as they carry out their mission at our borders. As technology continues to develop for those who wish to do good, so too do the capabilities of those that wish to harm the United States of America. As we have discussed today, we have seen how cartels have uh, uh, you know, taking drones to carry out illegal activities, including transporting weaponized payloads, conducting surveillance, and carrying out attacks on domestic critical infrastructure. 
Um, it is my understanding for every drone flown by border security, the Mexican cartel is flying 17 drones. We have technology to drop these drones, block these drones, intercept these drones, and do forensics on them. We're already doing this in Israel and the Ukraine, is my understanding. We must have a robust counter UAS program and capabilities to ensure we are able to meet these threats head on. Data shows the Mexican cartel are flying drones greater than 30 miles into U.S. airspace, landing and offloading drugs on U.S. soil. Um, fentanyl, heroin, cocaine, marijuana, and the list continues. Mr. Landrum, could you describe some of the challenges with detecting drones entering U.S. airspace and how counter UAS technologies can improve situational awareness within low altitude airspace at the border? Yes, Congressman. Thank you. Thank you for the uh, for the opportunity and the question. When it when it comes to detecting the drones that are in the airspace, it is very easy to detect a DJI drone because that end user agrees that through the end user license agrees to actually transmit that information, which is also very similar to remote ID, which came into effect earlier this year. And receiving that signal also gives you information such as height, altitude. Um, direction of travel, speed, you know, where, where it's actually at to actually locate it on a map to be able to do something about it. That is, that, that in itself is a very challenging process to be able to do that. To be able to detect all the other non-DJI drones, which in my opening statement I described as the other 16 manufacturers out there, to detect those others, it takes more than just that. It takes, it takes direction finding with radio frequency, plus radar, plus camera to be able to do that. And in the example in the Laredo demo where we brought that equipment down there to demonstrate that for CBP over, over the course of this year, what that did is that exposed the other 29% of drones that they were not seeing in that five mile stretch. Thank you. Some of these drones are much smaller than traditional aircraft that would show up on radar. How does this complicate detecting and preventing drone incursion? It, it is extremely difficult the smaller the device actually becomes and when it comes to the sensor fusion, being able to put something that is found either by radio frequency or by radar on camera. That is very difficult to, difficult done, to, to accomplish that and it's, it's not insurmountable. We do it as a company, but it is very expensive process to be able to do it. Thank you. At least four different executive branch departments, DHS, DOJ, uh, Defense and Energy have uh, statutory authority to use counter UAS technologies leading to overlap in who can respond to drones near sensitive sites and critical infrastructure. In your time in both government and the private sector, have you ever encountered a delay in response time to a UAS uh, incident because of institutional roadblocks such as overlapping jurisdictions? The, the only delay was initially in getting 124 and authority that, that, that in my personal experience. So, you know, going back to the 2017-18 timeframe, getting that operations plan in place and getting that actually approved. So there was a little delay there. Now the only thing that would delay that particular response is the lack of equipment or the lack of knowledge that a drone is flying in the airspace. Thank you. Following up on the same vein, would you agree that the dedicated counter UAS training center for authorized law enforcement and personnel uh, would be valuable? Yes, sir. That would be very val valuable. Thank you. I agree. And that's why I'm working to do just that. Let's create uh, a dedicated counter UAS training center for authorized law enforcement, train them effectively, and let's take care of business and protect the American people. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields. The gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Crane, is recognized for five minutes for question. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for holding this important hearing today. Thank you to the panel uh, for showing up and trying to educate us and help us understand this problem better. Uh, Sheriff, I want to say thank you for your service, um, and I want to start with you. Obviously, we're talking about technology. We're talking about drone, anti-drone technology. As somebody who's been in the field for a long time and uh, supervised others in the field, Sheriff, isn't it true that you can have all the technology in the world, but if your policies 
don't support the men and women that are designated to protect the homeland, it really doesn't matter? Yes, sir, I'd have to agree with that. Would you agree with the fact that this country, we have a massive amount of debt? Sure do. Yeah. The reason I bring that up is, is because I think everybody's in here, everybody in here is all about trying to stop these drones and um, counter the technologies that we see coming into the homeland and making our communities, our families, our states um, a lot more vulnerable and a lot less safe. But my issue is, is that this administration, unfortunately, has put policies in place that are completely swamping and overwhelming, not only Border Patrol, but you guys as well. Would you say that's correct, Sheriff? We have definitely, um, and you missed my open remarks, we have definitely seen a significant increase in my county of uh, illegal alien apprehensions and gotaways. To the tune at the highest watermark, we had a 417% increase in fiscal year 2022 compared to fiscal year 2020. And that was with apprehensions and a 467% increase in gotaways that same year. What about you, Mr. Landrum? Do you agree with Do you agree with that point that you can have all the technology in the world, but if you don't have leadership that's actually dedicated to stopping the flow of whatever it is, whether it be drones, drugs, MS-13 gang members, terrorists, suspected terrorists on the watch list coming through the southern border, it really doesn't matter. You absolutely need the leadership and the authorization to do it. And something that we, we as a company and me personally as a retired agent support is the expansion of those authorities, the 124N authorities to be able to do these activities to state, local, tribal, and territorial law enforcement officers and agents. Yeah, absolutely. Because at the end of the day, there's, there's no golden Connex box up here. I mean, well, we kind of act like there is. We just charge it to the American people's credit card and to their kids' credit card and their grandkids' credit card as we run up the national debt. But the bottom line is, like I'm saying, if you don't have policies that actually reflect a desire to stop the flow of what's coming over that southern border, it really doesn't matter because our law enforcement, our border patrol, their budgets are just completely overwhelmed with everything coming over that southern border. Um, I know uh, Mr. Bartu, Mr. Barto, is that how you say it? You were talking about, I think, four things that Congress can do. Can you repeat that list real quick, sir? Let me make sure I get it right by actually looking at my notes. Thank you. No. So first of all, we think that DHS can focus its contract requirements on results, right, rather than on input. So you're actually focused on what you want the contract to be able, uh, the results of that contract to be able to help in this case, Border Patrol agents, for example, to be able to do, what can they do differently? Focusing on results allows you to get past a lot of the problems in the contracting process, including, as we discussed earlier, what happens if technology evolves? Well, if you've got the results built into the contract, you can evolve the contract a little bit. So that's number one. Second is resources, because resources drive strategy way more than strategy drives resources, right? So we urge, urge the Congress to actually give DHS its appropriations on time rather than six or seven months into the fiscal year. So CBP has the money and a whole year to buy it, and you'll get the results a lot sooner. Third is, in fact, to hold their feet to the fire in terms of how long contracts take. Get the data, get DHS to be reporting that, get them to give you an annual report that says, here's how long our contracts take. Until you're measuring something, you're not gonna be able to take the steps to actually reduce that something. And the third is, or the fourth is, you gotta train the workers to do it, because as you point out, if the workers can't handle it and deal with it, it's gonna be a problem, not a solution. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields. Looks like we have no further questions for the panelists today. I have uh, some data to submit to each of you in writing because it was brought up during a questioning regarding the, the budget and the needs for, for resources. I'm going to share with you uh, in writing, all of you, but Mr. Landry in particular, how much the budget has increased uh, for the Department of Homeland Security over the last four years. So I'd, 
I thank uh, the witnesses for their testimony today and the members for their questions. The members of the subcommittees may have additional questions for the witnesses. And Mr. Chairman, do you have any further questions? may have additional questions for the witnesses, and we would ask for the witnesses to respond to these in writing. Pursuant to Committee Rule 7D, the hearing record will be held open for 10 days. Without objection, the subcommittee stand adjourned.